On a chilly day last winter in the Windy City's north side, the new face of the Chicago Cubs franchise went to meet some of its biggest fans, touting a new way of thinking about the club and its possibilities for hope. The thing about this place that unique to big cities, there's something about it that, that really reeks of way back uh, 30s, 40s, 50s. I really visualize not being a whole lot different except maybe for the cars on the streets. Joe Madden came to Chicago for one reason and one reason only, to bring a World Series title to the longest suffering fan base in sports. It's a generational uh, team here. It's almost like an heirloom. Things have been passed down for years and that what's been passed down is loyalty to this group. At the turn of the 20th century, the Chicago Cubs were known for one thing more than any other in professional baseball, winning. The Cubs, 1906, 07, 08, back then, the Cubs were the Yankees of the day. One of the great teams of all time. In 1908, the Cubs beat the Detroit Tigers to win the World Series. It was the last time the team won it all. 1908, 107 years ago. There were 16 teams. The internal combustion engine was just getting there. Flight was still a dream. Radio wasn't even invented. Uh, you had no live broadcasting of any kind in 1908. Most Americans didn't have telephones. They didn't have refrigerators. Women didn't have the vote. The Cubs peaked a little early, you might say. That was the highlight of their franchise so far. It wasn't as if the Cubs fell off the cliff right after 1908. In fact, over the next three decades, they'd reached six more World Series. Only thing was, they lost each one of them. Another pennant, another champion. But then, the next time they reached the Fall Classic, in 1945, came something else entirely, a curse. The Cubs curse supposedly derives from the fact that some sensible usher refused to let a guy bring a goat into the 1945 World Series. The story is strange, but true. But just as strange is the long, agonizing, all but unbelievable history it begat. The Cubs' tortured tale includes a black cat that walked in front of a dugout in 1969. In 69, they're ahead of the Mets going into September. Black cat walks by Ron Santo in the on-deck circle. It was the first time in a long time that the Cubs had even been close. A routine ground ball to first that became anything but that. 84. The Cubs make the playoffs. The it looks like they're one win away from the World Series. I remember listening to the game on the radio, riding my bike down to Wrigleyville. I was too young to get in the bars, but I just wanted to be down there. I knew nothing about the history of the Cubs and the Black Cat. Um, I didn't know anything about the Billy Goat. But as I look back on it now, it's like, how did that thing get away from us? Ground ball hit the dirt right through his leg! A man named Bartman who took his infamous turn in the spotlight in 2003. Five outs away from going to the World Series, they have the lead. And then all of a sudden... That was a catchable ball. The Cubs just went to hell after that. And bobbled by Gonzalez and everybody's safe. And the fans are in shock at Wrigley. And the curse gets brought up. So what are you going to do? To, how, how is anyone going to overcome that? Altogether, it makes you wonder, could this club really be cursed? Sometimes you don't want to believe, but the consistency <laughs> every year, like you believe something, it is just not right. And what would it feel like if a Cubs team ever found a way to somehow win it all? Cubs win! Just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean it won't. I understand the past, I get it, and I appreciate it, but let's move it forward. Let's look about, uh, you know, getting into the playoffs and getting back to the World Series and winning a World Series. Anthony Rizzo, gone! And keep playing it forward. Don't be playing it backward all the time. We have a shot now. Never permit the pressure to exceed the pleasure.
The first time you walk into Wrigley Field and you see, you know, all the colors, the green, the white, the blue, so vivid, it's like stepping into Oz. The friendly confines of Wrigley Field. It's a great place to play. It's wide open, blue skies. They have the vines in the outfield after they start growing in mid-May. You want magic? Wrigley Field has it. The look, the Cubs, the people, it's all magic. Wrigley Field has been one of baseball's most beloved ballparks for more than 100 years. So much so that Cubs ownership has at times designated it the franchise's main attraction. The Cubs are the lovable Cubbies. Even when the Cubs have been terrible, which has been often, it's always been great to come to Wrigley Field. There's always been an uplifting baseball atmosphere there. And a lot of people think that that might have actually held the Cubs back. For many years, the Cub theory was the team's not very good, the ballpark is a gem. Let's sell the ballpark. The ivy will be so lush and the grass so green and the sunshine so warm and the Heilman's old style lager beer so cold that no one will care what the scoreboard says. As long as they had Wrigley Field, as long as they had a loyal fan base, that maybe there wasn't the incentive to ruthlessly go for it. The Cubs thought of themselves as a quaint little replica from the past. It was all fun, it was all colorful, it was all enchanting, and had nothing to do with championship baseball. I got to play in, I think, 43 different major league ballparks. Nice to see you. How you doing? Good. And I always enjoyed walking to them whenever I could. Hey guys, there's something different about Wrigley Field. My first major league start was here as a member of the Florida Marlins, and I remember wanting to be a Chicago Cub and play here. And then to be here and be a, a guy that was at the stadium it's my office for nine years. I love watching the pitch, man. Oh, Thanks. So good. Well, I enjoyed all the fans and yeah. all the support I got here. was pretty incredible. It's a great place to play. It's like nothing else I've, I've really experienced. Just to be here and be a Chicago Cubs, it's, it's like being a rock star. Yeah, good to see you. The friendly confines have long been at the center of a distinct connection between the Cubs and their fans. But before last season, the Cubs' new ownership began a renovation of the park, sending a signal that the days of the club being stuck in its own past were over. And as Wrigley entered the second year of its renovation this past offseason, the team's roster was being rebuilt faster than many expected. It's official. John Lester introduced today as the new face of the franchise for the Chicago Cubs. I like to win, and I'm going in with the intention of winning in 2015. And that means the division, that means the World Series, that means everything. In 2015, the one camp I came away most impressed with was the Cubs camp. And not just because of all the new faces, but the talk and the rage was Chris Bryant. Get out the tape measure, long gone. Bryant, high drive. That ball is gone. Chris Bryant may have cleared the scoreboard. The Cubs third base rookie sensation combined with their new big arm. Swing and miss strike three. Number 10 for John Lester. Help get the club off to a promising start this spring. Cubs win! Swing and this Cubs win! Cubs for the first time since 2011. They've ripped off six wins in a row. When you think about the Cubs of 2015 and beyond, I mean, that farm system is just now getting there. I mean, you talk about the cavalry being on the way. There's more to come. This is a team that can be dangerous immediately. And it looks like they'll be a contender for a while. They're playing with a lot of confidence right now. And let's keep in mind that in Back to the Future, there's a billboard that says Cubs win World Series. And the year is 2015. Wait a minute. Cubs win World Series? Against Miami? Yeah, it's something, huh? Now, that might be a little bit ahead of schedule as we look at it, but they've got a chance. The Cubs' last chance in a World Series came 70 years ago in 1945 against the Detroit Tigers. What happened in that fall classic still haunts the North Side to this day because it was then 
that the curse of the billy goat was born. What I know is that Billy Cianis, who owned the Billy Goat Tavern downtown, wanted to bring the goat into Wrigley Field, but he was denied an admission. My uncle says, he has two tickets, he wants to get in the ballpark. And Mr. Wrigley says, the goat smells. My uncle got mad, says, I'm gonna put a curse on, then I'm gonna win anymore. Then the cops lost, and my uncle sent a telegraph to Mr. Wrigley. He says, who smells now? 1945 was the franchise's 10th World Series appearance. But since that fateful incident at Wrigley, they haven't been back. And 70 years later, fans can only shake their head at the reality. The Cubs don't even have a decent curse. I mean, for Pete's sake, the curse of the Bambino, the Red Sox have got fine. At least it's related to baseball. They're cursed because P.K. Wrigley, the then owner of the Cubs, refused to let a guy bring a barnyard animal, a goat, into the 1945 World Series. It's a Greek guy. It's a goat. I don't believe in goats. <laughs> We got the set in, sunshine, fresh air. We got the team behind us, so let's play too. They called Ernie Banks Mr. Cub. The Hall of Famer played his entire 19-year career in Chicago, never getting a chance to play in the postseason. But he never came closer than 1969. Hey, hey, holy the Cubs are on their way. Hey, hey, hey! The gonna pitch today. They're gonna hit today. They're gonna feel today. The Cubs are gonna go all the way. Good job, Homer! The Cubs win the game! I felt very strongly with the ball club we had, the pitching, the defense, that this was gonna be our year. 1969. Cubs with them. Santo, Banks, Ferguson Jacobs, Billy Williams. Wonderfully talented team. I just named four Hall of Famers. Ground ball in the hole. Picked off by Sano and he's got it. Banks, Sano, and Williams powered the lineup, while Jenkins led the way on the mound. He was our hope. I mean, he was uh, our joy when he came out on the field. We knew we were going to have a win. The ball game is all over. So in 1969, the Cubs make a run. All that's standing between them and the pennant is an expansion team for Pete's sake. We knew they had a good young pitching staff, but we didn't think that they would play this kind of baseball that they played. The Cubs were ahead by nine games in mid-August, but the Mets heated up as the summer came to a close, cutting Chicago's lead to two and a half games by early September. And next came a key two-game series in New York. The Cubs trailed early and then tied it in the sixth, but it was the Cubs. So during that rally, there was also an ominous sign. I was on the on-deck circle, and all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see this cat. It walked around me and went right there at the end of the dugout, and that's when I said to myself, that's not good. Who's that crossing in front of their dugout? It's not Lady Luck. The cat stopped and just kind of peered in. Most people think that was our jinx. The Mets would go back ahead soon after and go on to win both games of the series. Then the very next night, they'd vault ahead of the Cubs. Pitches hit through the middle and gonna go into center field. Oh, Mets will win it. Well, for the first time in the history of the New York Mets, they have gone into first place. The Miracle Mets would famously go on to win it all in 1969. But for the Cubs, the year was just another sad memory that would linger long afterwards. When we talk about a baseball team that possibly could win a pennant, we had the guys. It was an exciting season. I like to say we didn't lose, the Mets won. If it's meant to be, it will be. And it was just not meant to be. All this time afterwards, even with the list of other baseball calamities that have befallen the Cubbies, 1969 still stands out to fans of a certain age. That year, a six-year-old kid in Omaha, Nebraska, named Tom Ricketts, was just becoming a Cubs fan, never imagining that 40 years later, he would become the team's owner. The Ricketts have offered some $900 million to buy Wrigley Field, the Cubs, and Tribune Company's 25% share in Comcast Sportsnet. We're very excited to get started. There's a lot of work to do, 
But everyone needs to know that we are here for the long term and we are here to win. And as much as anything else, when Tom Ricketts and his family purchased the Cubs in 2009, they brought a fresh wave of hope for fans. What you want in the ownership is first, you want them to be a fan. Second, you want the owner to be a good business person. The Ricketts family, obviously, tremendous business talent. And Tom Ricketts lived for a while over a bar next to the ballpark. Now that's a hardcore Cubs fan. These guys care about each other. They care about the same things. They, they care about fans. I think they've manifested something that, that feels like family. And for Tom Ricketts, the team and its ballpark has a central place in his heart in more ways than one. My brothers and my sister and I used to uh, spend a lot of time in the bleachers, uh, pretty much every weekend home game for years. In one of those experiences, we all overheard some uh, women behind us talking about Omaha, Nebraska, which is where we all grew up. We started talking and uh, one of Cece's friends said, hey, you know, maybe you would like to meet my friend Cece. And, and now we have five kids. And I think we'll all remember that game forever. I mean, who would have thought at that time that our family would ever own the Cubs? But now that they do, after all the heartache and all the disappointment of all these years for the Cubs, the Ricketts family has only one simple wish. To win the World Series. The energy, the hope, the passion, it's all there. And, you know, we look forward to making sure that fans get to feel that World Series energy. Strike three, the game is over! It's a moment that no baseball fan will ever forget. So the winning run is at second base with two out, three and two to Mookie Wilson. Little roller up along first, behind the bag! It gets through Buckner! Here comes Knight and the Mets win it! And while Game 6 of the 86 World Series is one of the most memorable moments in baseball history, it's also proof for some fans that a baseball team can indeed be cursed. And maybe it's no surprise that before he played for the Red Sox, Bill Buckner was a Cub. In fact, he wouldn't have been at first base that night in 1986 had it not been for some mid-season wheeling and dealing by the Cubs general manager, Dallas Green, two years prior. He wanted to clean house and basically wanted to get rid of everybody that was there before he got there. So eventually I got traded to the Red Sox. The Cubs acquired future Hall of Famer Dennis Eckersley in that May 84 deal. And go figure, early that year, the plan appeared to be working like a dream. The 84 Cubs, that really felt like a year of destiny. I never had the feeling that they were going to lose games. They had a really great team. They had Durham, they had Rhino at second, Boa, Say. And almost three weeks after the Buckner deal, Green traded for Rick Sutcliffe. It would be one of the most successful mid-season trades in history and come just in time for an unforgettable afternoon at Wrigley. Today it's left-hander Steve Trout for Chicago and youngster Ralph Cinderella will go for the cards. Well, it was the NBC game of the week, so the focus of the baseball world is on this game. And it's at Wrigley Field. And it's against the Cardinals. So the setting is so classic. And in that setting, Ryan Sandberg put on a display for the ages. In the left center field and deep, this is a tie ball game. Sandberg's ninth inning homer, his fourth hit of the game, kept the Cubs alive. And then two innings later, he had a shot at more heroics. been known ever since as the Sandberg game. There was no denying it. 1984 felt like the year that the curse of the Billy Goat would finally be broken. As I came out, my wife had tears in her eyes. And she goes like, are all the games here like this? We knew that something special was going on. By September, the Cubs would find themselves heading to the postseason for the first time since 1945. And that Billy Goat. They go into the LCS, and there was no division series, no wild card then, so you just won the division, you played in the LCS and tried to get to the World Series, and it was best of five, and the Cubs win the first two games at home against the Padres easily. The Cubs try for a sweep at the series. It'll move to Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego, California. They seem like they had it all wrapped up. 
and they were already kind of celebrating on the airplane, drinking champagne. To have a two-game lead, to go to San Diego, we figured we'd won at least one of those three games there. But the Cubs lost game three and four, forcing a deciding game five in San Diego, a game that actually began well for Chicago. They're up three nothing, but because it's the Cubs, things not only have to unravel, they have to unravel in strange fashion. Trailing the Cubs 3-0, the Padres scored twice in the sixth to draw within a run. And then, just before the bottom of the seventh, the story goes that something unusual happened in the visitors' dugout. Before they ran out to go play defense, somebody knocked a big jug of Gatorade over, and it happened to go all over Leon Durham's glove. So he walked out there to play defense with a heavy first baseman's glove. Two batters later, Flannery came up as a pinch hitter with a tying run on second. I remember looking down and I saw Jody Davis's shadow move inside on me. So I was looking for a fastball inside. Ground ball hits the dirt right through his leg. Here comes Martinez. We're tied in three. It should have been an easy play. Durham's down doing everything he can to keep it from going through, but it got through anyway. You could just feel it. I mean, the next thing you know, there's a bloop down the left field line. A ground ball hits something and bounced over Sandberg's head, and we weren't able to do it. Off the hands, Nettles will go the short way, and then there were none. The Padres have won it all. It was truly heartbreaking. This close, gone. What I do remember is three times they had rolled champagne out into their clubhouse to celebrate and three times they wheeled it back out before the game was over and the third time we ended up buying their champagne half price and we not only beat the cubs we drank their champagne that's what i remember during the winter of 1984 a buddy got me a t-shirt that said chicago cubs world champs 1908 and to this day, I mean, at least once a week, I sleep in that T-shirt. I thought after 84, you know, we knocked on the door this year, we're going to knock the door down the next year. Of course, that didn't happen then, and it still to this day hasn't happened. The wait, of course, continues. Though even with a dose of infamy, that 1984 team is still beloved in Chicago. Well, they might not have won, but they were still heroes to us. Rick Sutcliffe won the Cy Young Award that year. Ryan Sandberg was the most valuable player, and we won 96 games, but uh, one little play gets away. Ground ball to first that gets by Leon Durham, much like Bill Buckner. Here we go again. The plays are eerily similar, eerily unforgettable for two teams trailed for so long by curses. And then there's the other connection, that Durham wouldn't have been playing first base that day had Buckner not been traded away earlier in the season. Eventually, Buckner was forgiven in Boston particularly after the Sox's own curse ended in 2004. The Boston Red Sox are world champions. A championship for which Boston fans can thank this man perhaps more than any other. Modern baseball has been the era of superstar general managers, and therefore it is one of the first things that the new Cub ownership under Tom Ricketts did was go out and get, if you will, a free agent general manager. Today, we take a major step to win a World Series. I'd like to introduce Theo Epstein. The big change was reaching out and getting Theo from Boston. And that was a big thing for Theo because he was leaving this sense of history that he helped be part of. But the ultimate challenge is to, to win with the Cubs. Using the same analytical approach he did in Boston, Epstein has created a team in Chicago that looks built for the long haul. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket and go for a short-term fix. By far the best way to do it is build it organically, piece by piece. That way when you get to a point of real competitiveness, you know that you're going to be there the next year, and the next year, and the next year. That's what Theo Epstein has done with the Chicago Cubs. 
This is one of the top farm systems in all of baseball. And you're not only seeing him draft these kids and put them in a system, but you see a system that knows how to develop them so that when they get to the big leagues, they're ready to play at that level. It's a triple. They've got four or five guys, 22, 23 years old, who are among the best young players in baseball. The fact that it's come so far in not as long as he thought, it's beyond impressive and incredibly exciting. Winning a World Series with the Cubs would be the greatest accomplishment in sports. It's going to be pretty darn special when it happens. Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! You know, if you're a lifelong Cubs fan, you're, you're a muscle. You're like hope muscle. It's been through a lot. It's sustained a lot. You know, you've worked out that muscle. You've, you've got a, a, a pretty good hope muscle. And there's been a couple huge disappointments that, you know, it wasn't that you lost hope, but you had to regenerate that, that muscle. Cubs fans know plenty about those kinds of predicaments. And it would be hard to argue that any of them were more painful than 2003, when the club won the National League Central and then got to where they'd been in 1984 within just one win of the World Series. The atmosphere of that entire day leading up to game six of the National League Championship Series in 2003, it's, it's almost indescribable. There were three or four times as many people outside of the ballpark as there were inside of the ballpark. Not only are the stands full of Cubs fans, Waveland Avenue is filled with thousands of fans. To see the mass of people out beyond the wall outside the stadium and everybody believing, truly believing, they were going to win that game and go to the World Series. So we go to the World Series, baby! I was telling my son, I hope I live long enough to see another World Series. If they don't choke, maybe I will. Well, the stars seem to be aligned for the Chicago Cubs, but we are talking about the Chicago Cubs. 3-0 Chicago. And the Cubs fans can smell it now. By the top of the eighth, the anticipation was tantalizing, but even Cubs fans couldn't envision what was about to play out next. And the Marlins beginning to run out of outs. They're down to their final five. Again in the air, down the left field line. Oh, yeah. Reaching into the stands and couldn't get it. He's living with a fan. Young man named Bartman tries to catch the ball. Wasn't fan interference. He wasn't sticking his hand out over the field. For me, over at first base, I can't tell if that ball is in the stands, if it was still on the field. But then Moises got upset, so then I know that he felt like he had an opportunity to catch it. That was a catchable ball. That's a foul ball. I mean, it was still a foul ball. It wasn't ruled a double or a home run. It was a foul ball. It's, it's a strike, OK? You throw another strike, get another pop up, and you're out of that thing. It looked like Alou would have made the catch. But keep in mind, they had a sizable lead, and Pryor was sailing along. So that one play would just be a footnote if a bunch of other stuff didn't happen subsequently. Into left field, a base hit by Rodriguez to make it a three to one ball game. Ground ball towards short. Gonzalez has it, bobbles it, and everybody is safe. Now it's Gonzalez, who I think had made only 10 errors all year, boots a potential double play ball that opens the floodgates. Hammer down the left field line, and the game will be tied up. What a turn of events. And the fans are in shock at Wrigley. People in the stands probably sensed what generations have had to endure that feeling in golf the stadiums. Silence here at Wrigley Field in Chicago. How did this happen? I mean, it was, it was shocking how fast it all happened. We just, like, lost focus. That was everything. It's something, like, inexplainable and pretty much suck everybody energy. We saw it right away. When you see players with the head down, that tells you that, you know, they're like, why this happened? And immediately, we really take advantage of it. That ball hammered into left center field. Three runs are going to score on a double by Mordecai. It's an eight to three game. A nightmare of an eighth inning. You can start to see fans get really upset with this man who is being blamed for Moise Salou not being able to catch 
what would have been an out in that eighth inning. I'm telling you what, they better have some security for him. I mean, seriously. You could see that something very bad was starting to brew out there in the stands. I think it's safe to say the fan did something, Steve, that any normal person would react in such a way. And it's certainly we're walking a fine line now, you know, of fans getting out of control and doing something that they shouldn't do. And now all of a sudden, you can see some fans starting to move around and push and shove and finger pointing. All of a sudden, somebody throws something. There, yeah, throw there they go. Oh, there they go. Uh oh, look at that. Throwing beer on them. Look at this. What happened to Bartman was just so wrong and so cruel. Step back. Step back. A whole bunch of stuff had to happen in that inning as it unraveled. So to say that Bartman's play alone changed the inning, changed the game, changed the series, it's just wrong. And it's safe to say that every Cub fan has to be wondering right now, is the curse of the Billy Goat alive and well? I'm walking out of Wrigley Field. A fan says to me, Mr. Will, Cubs will get him tomorrow. I said, not a chance. Sure enough, the Cubs lost game seven ensuring the year 2003 and the Bartman game would become indelible chapters in the franchise's saga of misery. And the Florida Marlins have come back from three games to one down to win the National League pennant. What an amazing story. It turned into the quietest night at Wrigley I'd ever heard. It was, it was like below silence, whatever that is. It was like a black hole. It took me a week. I had a boss at the time who was, was a great big Cubs fan. I called him. I said, I'm not going to come in for the next couple days. He didn't need to know why. He knew exactly what I was talking about. He said, no problem. After we lost and we, it took me a month to get back to normal. <laughs> it took me a month. I really, really, that's her. I, I thought that was a year that we have a chance to make all the way. We had the potential, we had the manager, we had the right player in position, but you know, we were close. Five outs from the World Series. Five outs. I mean, the Cubs went into that series with Kerry Wood and Mark Poirier. They were going to be the future of a dynasty. The anchor of a perennial all-star rotation didn't work out. And to have it not work out on a foul ball, for Pete's sake, I mean, that just sums up the Cub experience. I'm still thinking about that until today. I'm still thinking about it. It's hard, you know, but, you know, I can live with that for the rest of my life. That kind of pain can embed itself deep into the consciousness of a team and a fan base, which means you need leaders of uncommon skill to come in and turn the aura around. Leaders like Joe Matten. We are here uh, on a very important day uh, for the Chicago Cubs. It's my pleasure to introduce the manager of the Chicago Cubs, Joe Matten. Hiring Joe Madden was a master stroke. He's not just a good manager in game, he's a presence. He gives a team an identity, he gives uh, a clubhouse a certain feeling. There have been a lot of great managers who have sat in that seat and haven't gotten it done in right. 106 years. Beautiful. Do you have any idea what the hell you've gotten yourself into? I love it. I actually love it. The, the challenge is so outstanding. How could you not want to be in this seat? He's able to keep away that whole vibe of we haven't won in, you know, over 100 years. He embraces that. This is a one in 107 year opportunity for me right now, or 108 years, whatever it's setting at right now. I'm way too optimistic to worry about things like that. I don't focus on stuff like that. I refuse to. He's a tremendous individual. He's, he's different in a really, really great way. I've been there before. I think I know it works. Uh, this is a whole different set of circumstances. This moment is an entirely different moment than any year that, any moment that's preceded it. He seems to be instilling confidence, enthusiasm, positivity. I think that's a beautiful thing. It's up to us to capture this moment and, and project it forward like we, we think we can. going to happen this year. We're going to win the NL Central and I'm going to discuss, I'll quote me on that. 
that's what we're expecting, and that's what we're going to put our sights on, and we're not going to accept anything else. While Anthony Rizzo's bold prediction may have fallen a bit short this season, his club has been as exciting as any Cubs team in years. Cubs win! Cubs win! Earning a wild card spot in the postseason, following a spring and summer filled with highlights. And Jake Arrieta has thrown his first career no-hitter. No one expected this. You know, this year was supposed to be another rebuilding year. It's almost like we're getting to open our presents early. Incredibly exciting. Schwarber sends it toward the bleachers and it's gone. Watching these kids come in was kind of great. It's a lot of fun to watch Schwarber and Brain. Rizzo, who's been here a while. It's Anthony Rizzo, what a play down there to save at least one run. One of the things that I like it is they win in close game. So when you win in close game, you have a chance to go all the way. The Cubs' success this season has been about on-field production, yes, but also a sea change in the collective mindset, starting on the diamond and flowing outward to so many long-suffering fans. Something special is happening here. You know, our players believe in where we're going. Our manager believes in where we're going. We all believe in where we're going. Oh, what a moment for the kid. This is a new generation here. What we're building here is something special, and the city knows it, and we know it. We're establishing a winning mentality in the clubhouse. Guys just want to go out there and win. They don't care how good they do individually. I mean, they're there to help the team win in any way possible, and that's all you can really ask for out of a team. It's a new era. It's a new team. And I think with that, the fans have had to buy in to say, look, maybe what's happened in the past needs to stay in the past. I believe that over time, Probabilities even out, luck evens out, foul balls down the left field line even out, and the Cubs, at long last, are going to win the World Series several times. Game over! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, baby! Their collection of young stars weren't even alive in 1969 or for that matter, 1984. So black cats and foul balls down the left field line don't mean much to them at all. This group is about something different, the next chapter in Cubs history, and the chance to lead generations of fans to a promised land they've long worried they might never see. It would mean the world to a lot of people. A lot of generations of Cubs fans have waited a long time for their team to win the World Series. And when it does happen, it's going to be a very special moment for us players, for our families, for the organization, and for the city of Chicago. Celebration time on the diamond at Wrigley. First thing I think of is the Cub fan. To finally say that you're the World Series champion. And that 1908 Chicago Cubs World Series t-shirt that I sleep in, I'll finally be able to put it away and find me a new one. It's even hard to imagine or even grasp what the feeling it'd be like when they do it. Winning a World Series for these fans who've waited so long and who deserve it so much will be something that all of us will be proud of for the rest of our lives. Brothers in arms in the streets and the stands. There's man. 
magic in the alley in the old scoreboard The same when I stared at as a kid keeping score In a world full of greed I could never want more Teaching us faith and giving us hope United we stand and united we'll fall Down to our knees today we win it all Yeah, I heard him and he said, oh, let's play too Or did he mean 200 years? In the same ballpark, a diamond, our jewel The home of our joy and our tears when the day comes for that last winning run And I'm crying and covered in fear I look to the sky and know I was right To think someday we'll go out of way yeah. Someday the Chicago Cubs are going to be in the World Series And maybe sooner than we think So, what's it going to mean for you, personally, after so many years, when they do eventually go all the way? I have no idea. I mean, it's like, 